Well, you know, I'm going to jump in at an odd place uh, because there's so many things we could do here and we're going to take all the time we need, by the way. Um, but let me let me jump in in a, in a strange place. You talked about something we saw coming, you know, back in the 1980s. I forget. Let's just pick a date. Maybe it was 82, 83. My father's books were huge bestsellers in the evangelical market. We took a full page ad out in the New York Times, which I think at the time we paid $60,000 for, now it would be more or perhaps less because papers have diminished, but this is back in the good old days of print when it was everything. And the ad was, this book should have been number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And that I think was his book, How Should We Then Live? Because in fact, numerically, we were outselling the book that was currently number one on the New York Times bestseller list by two to one. Okay, in hardcover. And this was back in the days when evangelicals weren't even on the radar. It was, you know, Newsweek was the last American magazine to have a religion section. Time magazine didn't have one. The New York Times had a style section and a science section and all sorts of stuff, but not religion. Religious books were never reviewed because it was those people out there somewhere in the middle of the country that doesn't matter. Who knows what they're doing? They're even more irrelevant than the Rust Belt. I mean, I'm being facetious and nasty, but that's the truth. So the kind of East Coast snobbery kept book counts from bookstores and Christian bookstores and religious bookstores out. I can picture Hillary and Bill Clinton somewhere reading the New York Times and checking out the book review section of what's important in this country and what showed up on their radar. Yep. Never a religious book like How Should We Then Live talking about how secular humanism was replacing Christianity. And then later my dad's book, A Christian Manifesto, calling evangelicals to armed insurrection unless Roe v. Wade could be overturned. None of this was on their radar screen. So I got on the Today Show with Jane Pauley and she interviewed me and the head of the American Library Association who was your a more typical New York liberal in that mold back in my right wing days when I was an evangelical shill and a an nepotistic sidekick to my father. And I argued a point which actually even today I would agree with. And that was, you should be including our books. Now it would have a very different spin to it. And I would be telling people, you have not paid attention to this world and it has now eaten you alive. Because not only did what my dad called for come true on January 6th, a first step, but we're now facing not a Republican win, but a, a theocracy, if these people get their way, they've got a majority on the Supreme Court that has just knocked down Roe v. Wade. So we, quote unquote, speaking as my old self, won. They, have, they are getting ready to attack gay marriage and gay rights. Contraceptives are being challenged and already on the docket. We have them saying they're going to take a case to take another look at voter rules and gerrymandering and all the rest of it from the point of view of what Republicans want in state houses and so forth. So I'm going to come back to a question to you after my little rant here. What is the state of both secular media commentary and the academic community when it comes to at last noticing and deigning to comment upon the fact that there are tens of millions of evangelicals that have taken over the Republican Party and yet that group of people on the left or a more liberal point of view still don't seem to be willing to take the time to understand who they are, what they want, and their own intellectual firepower. It's easy to, do, to talk, call them all rubes, but they're still not dealing with the Francis Schaeffers of this world or the G.T. Chestertons or the Bill Buckley's who started National Review, that whole intellectual tradition, which is, you know, because you came from that background, had real weight and right now is dominating the Supreme Court of the United States through the Federalist Society and others. Okay, after a very long-winded thing there, I want you to have an equally long-winded uh, response because I think that must have triggered a lot of stuff in your head. Oh, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I, com I come from rural Indiana. I come from folks who worked in factories, who worked in mines, who you know were, were janitorial staff and, and, and prison guards, you name it. Um, they are not rubes. Uh, 
And there is a uh, classist view in this country that I think has actually undermined a lot of potential and actually done a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in the 1980s. This is when obviously my family was starting to really get in deep into these religious narratives. And on the back of things like how should we then live, we're more apocalyptic conspiratorial sort of books and culture. Um, this is right around the time where you start having the stirrings of like the New World Order conspiracy theory, right? The idea that a satanic uh, conspiracy was going to overthrow America and turn everything into a one world government, which, by the way, is a leftover of communist fear mongering of the Red Scare. Well, eventually what happens is as the rest of the country starts to move beyond those Rust Belt areas that you're talking about, including my small, idyllic, you know, hometown, mm. all of a sudden the factories that my family is working in, the places where they're uh, actually like able to afford homes, you know, with the salaries that they have, those mm. things start going away, obviously, because of free trade and deindustrialization. Uh, my family didn't have the understanding of economics that a lot of these people were talking about do. You know, people in East, Eastern and, and, and Western elite circles understand industrialization and economics and politics because they've gotten the educations that allow them to, because they are a managerial class that oversees all of this. They understand all of this. My family didn't know that. You know, they went to school, they, they were taught a very actually religious tinged education. You know, you look up to America, God is on our side. It's a very religious type of education. Meanwhile, their religious leaders are telling them this is a satanic plot.